Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Herbal Knowledge Keepers with Dakota Granny Woman and myself, Blue Star Dear Woman. And this is episode 18. And our topic today, we're continuing on chronic Lyme and co-infections. So I hope you tune in with us. This is a full bloom production. And please um, sign up uh, for a subscription to the Herbal Database, which this show is based upon, and you'll see demonstrated throughout this episode. So welcome, Dakota. Greetings. I see you're in a new location. And you have some kind of like a wind chime or some kind of floating thing in the background. I couldn't figure out what it was, but <laughs> it's pretty yeah. cool. I'm, I'm, yes, I'm in this very wonderful shamanic environment filled with uh, mobiles of crystals and prisms and indigenous pieces of art. It's just absolutely gorgeous here. It's, it's lovely. For those of you who are watching this video, all of them are compiled on it on a page dedicated to Lyme at the Herbal Database. That's herbaldatabase.org. And as they come out, they're being posted in our Facebook group, Herbal Knowledge Keepers. And they're also on Full Bloom and other places. So uh, if you want to see the whole series in one place, go to the Herbal Database and look it up. And of course, you'll be inspired to subscribe to the Herbal Database. It's a rather inexpensive way to get well. Let's continue. I'm going to open up the database now. And while you're opening that, just a reminder to our viewers, if you go to episode one, uh, we do the introduction on how to use this. But throughout the episodes, we, uh, we review. All righty. So, I've opened it up to Lyme disease, and you can see how much is involved here. If this is the first show you've watched, I would suggest you go back a few episodes from the very beginning. And one of the issues with Lyme disease is that for a lot of people, it just doesn't seem to go away. It becomes chronic. Mm -hmm. And so we're going to start talking about that, why that happens. We can just move down here to this topic, chronic Lyme disease. Click on it to open it up. And we can start unwrapping this. Now what you're looking at here is the main heading, chronic Lyme disease. And some of the associations that are important for understanding this. One of the reasons I've connected multiple sclerosis to this is that, uh, and there are other conditions I could link up to it, but MS has been pretty strongly associated with chronic Lyme. In other words, it might not be MS at all. It might be chronic Lyme. So that's just something for folks to check out. And then we've got Lyme neuroborreliosis. We're not going to get into that this time. That is when it's kind of like a stage four Lyme where it's really severely impacted the nervous system. But here we're going to look at multiple systemic infectious disease syndrome, MSIDS for short. But before we do that, let's lift up the information panel. I'm clicking this upward pointing arrow to lift it all the way up. But I'm going to do it a different way today. I'm just going to grab onto this and slide it up that far. Just kind of go through a little bit about chronic Lyme disease here. Now these are links that you could click on for videos and other information about chronic Lyme in general. You'll see here that there's no firm definition that everybody agrees on as far as what is chronic Lyme. There's some doctors that say it you don't have it for a good year. They, they say if you still have Lyme for a, after a year, then it's chronic Lyme. Other doctors say if you don't get rid of it pretty quickly, it's moved into a chronic state. So here are some defi different definitions of chronic Lyme and why it might happen, how to manage it. There can be a stage where it's an active infection. It can be driven by an auto-inflammatory process. And if so, 
If it's active, then antibiotic treatment is indicated. It could also be a stage where there's autoimmunity and that where it says look for reactivity to bands 31 and 34, that is in something like your Western blot where there are all these different bands indicating different types of antibody reactions and they're all numbered. So if those particular numbers show up, then that's an indicator that there could be autoimmunity going on. Of course, we already know Lyme it has a pretty severe effect on the immune system as a whole. And then there can be permanent damage. So here, if there's been permanent damage, then rehabilitation needs to be looked at. And here's a caution. Surgery is really tricky because healing can be impaired. And so people with active Lyme are prone to developing internal adhesions and scarring. And then here's some on autoimmunity. And then viral infections in chronic Lyme. Uh, we're going to get into that next. And so let's just lower the screen. I'm going to click on this big category. So what is now understood is that when Lyme persists, more than often it's because of these co-infections. Lyme frequently is mixed in with a wide variety of parasites, viruses, other bacteria, and we'll kind of break that down some for you. So what this means is that kind of the new understanding about it is that there are all kinds of different infections in different parts of the body. And that's part of what makes it so confusing and so difficult to treat. I feel for the poor doctors trying to figure this out. Dr. Horowitz is one of our leading Lyme experts, and he describes the role of co-infections with this condition. And you all, when you're watching this video, can just pause this and read. Here's an important key step in dealing with this is the differential diagnosis. How in the world are you supposed to sort out what mm -hmm. pathogen is causing what, right? Mm -hmm. For Lyme disease itself, like if you just have Lyme, what they call that is Lyme borreliosis. And that's it. You've only got Lyme. And so here are some of the, the symptoms, fatigue, headache arthralgias, that's like aching uh, joints, muscle pain, cognitive difficulties. And the clue that it's Lyme is that these aches and pains migrate. So sometimes it's in your knee, then later on you notice that you've got uh, your hips are aching, that sort of thing. It's not just staying mm -hmm. in one place. So these symptoms tend to come and go. Women will notice that it tends to flare before, during, and after their menstrual cycle. So those are cues that it's Lyme. Then we've got Babesia, and uh, we'll touch on that today. Babesia is malarial-like, and so the kind of symptoms that come up with that, and this can easily be mixed in with Lyme, fever, chills, day sweats, night sweats, an unexplained cough, short SOB meaning shortness of breath. Symptoms persist even though Lyme has been treated. People who have Lyme and Babesia tend to have much worse Lyme symptoms. So Babesia makes Lyme itself worse. Then we have you know, here. right there. Uh, yeah, Dakota, right there. Uh, because I'm treating, uh, have recently treated the Rocky Mountain spotted fever, and I don't know how to pronounce this one, but I was also diagnosed with that Ehrlichia. Oh, er Ehrlichia. Ehrlichia. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I'm a candidate right now because I have an unexplained cough right now. That's, yeah, I was thinking of that for you, too. And shortness of breath. Right? And I have shortness of breath. Yep. That's mm -hmm. what I'm dealing with now. Yeah. But I just wanted to note that, that, you know, I'm one of your candidates here. Well, so many people are. And it's possible you could have Babesia, Ehrlichia, Rocky Mountains fever, fever and no, no Lyme. <laughs> you know, it's exactly. I mean, I am treating myself now 
uh, as potential Lyme. Yeah, and that's a good idea, especially since you're using something we covered in a previous show to help your bacteriophages knock it off. And we're going to do a little special about Dear Woman's experience using the ABAT. No, you're not using ABAT. Uh, well, you're, us you're using the Borelogen, yeah. Then as far as Ehrlichia goes, the differential there is the fevers can be really high and there are low white blood cell counts and low platelet counts and elevated liver functions, okay? So that's what you look at for the presence of Ehrlichia. Then we've got Bartonella. And here's where about 60% of just Lyme patients that are on antibiotic treatment get better. And then slightly is about 40% that don't. When symptoms continue, even though there, you've had the proper course, and again, there's a protocol for correct antibiotic use for Lyme. Let's say you've had the right protocol, but the symptoms are continuing, especially, you know, the fatigue, the headache, resistant arthritis, and something called resistant encephalopathy, cognitive difficulties, a new onset of a seizure disorder, or a history of seizure disorder, uh, there can be eye manifestations such as loss of vision, something called neuroretinitis. These things indicate that it could be Bartonella. And we'll, we'll look at that in a minute. Then there can be mycoplasma, chlamydia, and different viruses. So that can be an underlying role with resistant symptoms. And then also candida yeast syndrome which tends to go along with taking antibiotic drugs, that can crop up. So those are some of the differentials to look at for what might be behind chronic Lyme. Click that downward arrow, and let's go to Lyme co-infections. There we go, those are the big players. Let's just start with the viral infections in chronic Lyme. All of these different viruses have been implicated in chronic Lyme disease. So one of the things that happens is the immune, your immune system normally may be able to eradicate these. However, as we know, Lyme and some of the other co-infections depress the immune system, allowing these things to just take over. So these are the most common type. And you'll see here under classical treatment, these antivirals have been used successfully, I guess. And then here is a complementary alternative treatment. And you'll notice there some of the recommendations are the use of something called transfer factors. You can look that up in the database. An example is colostrum. Various mushroom derivatives increase the natural killer cells and T cells. Those are the 1,3-glucans and 3,6-glucans. You can look that up. And then olive leaf extract, which is pretty interesting. It's viricidal against a lot of different viruses, including the herpes, influenza A, Kawasaki, and others. I have a question there. Um, does cordyceps uh, fit into that category since it's mushroom derivative? Yeah, yeah. Well, it is a mushroom, yeah. All of the medicinal mushrooms can be very helpful with all of this because okay. they help your immune system. So I'm just going to lift this screen up again, doing the same way. And I just want to read you. We talked a little bit. We haven't really gotten into Stephen Buhner's protocol too much. But here's a quote about what he says about these co-infections. He says about, I already mentioned, 60% of the people who are infected with Lyme can be helped by antibiotics. 5 to 10% aren't. 30 to 35% appear to be helped, but it, they relapse. Added to that are the very large group of people who were never properly diagnosed with Lyme. About half of those heal naturally over time, but others don't. In consequence, there's a large group of people with chronic Lyme. In that population, about half respond to a fairly simple herbal protocol. Others won't. Herbs are much more elegant medicinal agents than pharmaceuticals. 
in that they contain hundreds to thousands of complex compounds that work together synergistically when confronted by disease organisms. The plants have been here a lot longer than people. They've developed extremely sophisticated responses to infections. They get the same kind of infections we do. And when we mm -hmm. treat them internally, those plant responses are medicine for us. The very nature of stealth pathogens, which these are, and their wide impacts on the body make herbs a very useful approach. In essence, successful, and this is really key, successful treatment of Lyme infections, and that includes the, these co-infections, needs to address mm -hmm. immune status. That's where your mushrooms come in and other things. Inflammation right. dynamics. So in the database, you can go to inflammation itself and learn about it and see all of the beautiful different herbs that help to bring down inflammation. They can affect the cytokines. And um, inflammation mm -hmm. is breaking down cellular tissues in the body. That's what the cytokine cascade is. And then there are herbs. There's specific treatments for specific symptoms, so you can go to symptom relief and de deal with it that way. And then there can be long-term damage, and we need restorative herbs for that long-term damage that can be done, especially in the nervous system. Each of these problems can be addressed with one or two plants due to the complexity of the compounds in the plants. So that's the way to get started, understanding when you look at all these things, it can be overwhelming, but as we start to plug in plant medicine, we simplify our lives a great deal. Okay, mm -hmm. so here's more. You guys can, can just pause this and read it. However, one of the other points is that because it's so common to have co-infections, Near the beginning of your treatment for Lyme, it's really important to be treating those at the same time because if you don't, then the, when, the chronic, when the Lyme becomes chronic, it's more difficult to get rid of it. Mm -hmm. So two of the big ones are Bartonella and Babesia, and you can read through this. Here we have more about what they're calling polymicrobial infection. Here we have more on differential diagnosis. I think, I think one of the most important things I've learned in doing this research, Dakota, is the co-infections. Yeah. Uh, I think, uh, you know, I know we're not going to get into my example right now, but the symptoms that I'm having are going back to some childhood uh, illnesses related to asthma. Uh-huh. And I think when my immune system got so challenged, uh, it's kicked up those old, old symptoms that I haven't had in years. Yeah. And so, uh, if, you know, so you get, you do get a little distracted because you go, oh, wow, you know, I've had this bout before. But the, I think that's what's starting to really get my attention is the fact that there's these other infections going on that you have to follow backwards and find the origins in these, um, in Lyme, for instance. Yeah. Yeah. And, and learn of, uh, some of the key pointers about them. That'll help you to go, well, I've got a little bit more of this going on than that. And because there is some differential diagnosis that you can do. So babesiosis is a pretty common co-infection. And here, let's just take a quick look at this. We're trying to make this a short show. So this one is from an organism that is kind of like a, a malarial parasite. So it's very similar to malaria. It suppresses the immune system. Here's some recommendations from Buner. And here are problems with Babesia testing and treatment, we'll open that up in a minute. And then there are clinical presentations of babesiosis, which just means that's the infection with babesia. One of them being an atypical cough, shortness of breath without any malarial signs or symptoms. 
in a chronic mm. Lyme patient. Does that ring a bell? Yes, it does. And you know what's starting to go through my mind? What? I traveled Central America, and even though I did the malaria vaccine, uh huh. I spent several months in Central America in very mosquito-ridden areas, and I'm just starting to wonder about that. Okay. And so here we have a comparison of treatments. Well, not really a comparison, but just listing the drugs that are used for this. And notice neem down there. I think this comes from Dr. Horowitz. And he uses mm -hmm. neem leaf as part of the standard drug treatment. And then there's another, more research has been going into cryptoleptids in dealing with Babesia. But what you can do is, if understanding that it is so close to, to malaria, you can, we have wonderful herbs for malaria that are shown to help Babesia. So these here are herbs that you can use. Learn about them, you know, don't just take a random. There's that ABAB that you were wondering about. Okay. ABAB, okay. Mm -hmm. So that's specific, a specific herbal formula for babesiosis. Now on Babesia testing, if somebody's going to go lay out the buck, you might have to pay for this. If you're going to be tested for it, check this section out. The, these are recommendations of what kind of testing is most likely to pick it up. What, uh, as with Lyme, one of the problems with this is that there are, I think there's like a hundred different species of Babesia and the tests are only designed to pick up just a few of those. So that's why it's recommended that you do a Babesia panel and this describes what that is and here's a look at what is in that panel. So if you have a good doctor who is willing to do the work and a way to pay for it, these are, in that Babesi panel, these are the things, the kind of tests you want to have done. Your doctor will understand all this stuff. Here's problems with treating, the testing and treating. Uh, just read that. It, there are over 100 species of these protozoa. The, the technical name for them is preoplasms. Most of the zoonotic just means passed on through animals, uh, including insects. Most of them are due to these uh, microti and divergence and a few of these others and because there's so many different species mm -hmm. of these patients can have malarial type symptoms but the standard antibody testing for one species can be false a false negative mm -hmm. and uh, so another thing to know is that these Babesia parasites are in the blood supply now so there's a transfusion risk. As we mentioned before, there's a transfusion risk with Lyme as well. Okay, so moving right along. I have it linked to, again, being that this is a concept map, everything that's directly related to it is important to know something about. So fever is one of the big signs of Babesia. Night sweats. Restless leg syndrome, and also it can sometimes cause something called acute respiratory distress syndrome, unexplained fevers, chills, sweats, and flushing. So let's just go back to the co-infections and take another look. Here we've got Bartonella is another common co-infection, and let's just Pull up the screen for a moment. This one can be passed along to a fetus through the placenta, if the mother has it. With Bartonella, this is another type of a bacterial infection. And here we see what kind of cells it targets. We see some of the diseases that it can cause. So. There's something called Bartonella endocarditis. That's a, a heart infection. Then there are the granulomatous inflammatory disease. You can find out about that by clicking on this link. Uh, chronic intravascular infections. 
and vasoproliferative tumors, those are basically tumors in the eye. So there's vision. Mm. Sounds nasty, huh? Yeah, it does. Oh, it can cause radiculitis. So what that is is it, a nerve pain that radiates right along a nerve. There can be a rash. This is what the Bartonella rash looks like. Let me get that spelling on that. Radiculitis. Radiculitis. That's kind of interesting because we've done some episodes on um, chronic pain. Yeah. And neurological pain, and so that just caught my attention as something to investigate. That's a good mm -hmm. idea. <laughs> Here's the Bartonella right. rash. Look right. how different that is. You wouldn't think, you would look wow. at that, you, you just would think, what in the world did I run into? Right? Again, it looks like the stretch marks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it does, like with Lyme, this rash doesn't always appear. So if you have it, you're lucky. It tells, you've got a sign that's telling you what's going on. So uh -huh. here's, here's the conventional treatment, and these are Buner's recommendations. If you have active herpes, chicken pox, or shingles, don't use LR. Try to get all of the cautions in here. That's why it's important to read everything and to, and to understand that we're providing protocols. So in a lot of this stuff, there's a very specific protocol that you want to use to avoid things like Herxheimer or minimize it. Now here's on, if you want to test for Bartonella, it's not an easy thing to test for. This test is an amplified version of a, a PCR. So this is the one that you want to take and it tells you how much it costs. You can probably have to pay for that yourself, but it's not as bad as some. So you can go to there and find out more about testing for it. What you're, what you're presenting, too, is a reminder that you have to stay on the trail of this research. You have to examine every particular response that you're having in your body. Yeah. And um, so these are all different things related to this condition. This is the genus of what causes it. And here we have another formula from Byron White, A. Bart. So that one's specifically for Bartonella. And then we see things like Hawthornberry. Japanese knotweed pops up again. That's also for Lyme and a lot of these infections. So if you're taking Japanese knotweed for Lyme, you can find out which other conditions it's treating at the same time. And that can be, that can kind of tell you, if you see this is covering a lot of bases, that might be something you want to do. Now this is a type of Borrelia, a type of Lyme spirochete, the Borrelia miyamotoi, is causing some different kinds of issues in the body. Uh, something called tick-borne relapsing fever, and it's new on the scene. This is a new, well, it may have been around for a long time, but we're just realizing that how infectious it is and what it does. There's no reliable blood test for it. It's expected that this new form of Lyme is probably going to surpass Borrelia burgdorferi Lyme in 10 to 15 years. It can explain resistant symptoms in patients. And there's in California is where it's really taking off. So you can read about that. We are now having to look at this as one of the frequent co-infections, as, as frequent as the others. Until recently, this wasn't looked for or understood at all. So here's also about testing, about persistence, and there's a new test that's being developed. Of course, candida, if, especially if you're taking antibiotics, and there's so much that herbs can do to treat candida. So just clicking on herbs for candida, for example, gives you a, a wide array and in each of these headings it's going to tell you how they help with candida. Here are different agents. Now when I say agents to treat candida, these are plant phytochemicals and so if you want to know well where do I get beta glucans from, you can click on this and see 
You've, these are some of the areas where you get beta-glucans. And then we can drill down even further. And you may remember these beta-1,3 glucans we spoke about earlier as being important for the immune system. And here are some of the mushrooms that they're found in. Mm -hmm. so through the agents to treat, then we can start looking for what plants have this in them. All right, so let's go back up and we we'll just kind of skim through these co-infections. Um, chlamydia, there's your ehrlichiosis. That's mm -hmm. a pretty common co-infection. And these are herbs that help get rid of that. This is specific to this particular type of Ehrlichiosis uwingi. It's a little bit of a different form of it because this is the organism. You can trace back, if you're interested in finding out what the, the life story is of these bugs, you can mm -hmm. read about them directly, you know, and see what they are. So these are different yes. conditions that it can bring on, so different forms of this infection. Here are videos and articles about ehrlichiosis. Licorice and ginger support doxycycline in, in treating this, so in helping the white blood cell count. So doxy is one of the antibiotics that does particularly well with ehrlichia. It does, doxy does better with mm -hmm. ehrlichia than it does with Lyme. If you are taking doxy in the very beginning of getting sick and you also have ehrlichiosis, then it's a possibility you'll get rid of it right away. However, notice it says doxy is supported by licorice and ginger. So, and you'll recall from another show that milk thistle is needed to protect your liver from doxy. So we've got herbs that help if you are taking these antibiotics to improve them and to protect your body from their effects. Now here are yeah, uh, yeah. we can add Dakota add that ABX, uh, which my homeopathic doctor from Kansas City recommended when I was on the doxy. When I was on the doxy antibiotic, I was about two days into it, three days into it. It was, you know, I could feel it in my body. It was a little nauseous, nauseating. Uh -huh. And then I started the ABX, and it immediately eliminated the nausea, and I felt the balance in my body. I felt like I was able to um, uh, digest it or integrate it better. Okay, good. Um, all right, back into co-infections. And Ehrlichia can be very dangerous, so you really want to get that. The Powassan virus is also carried by insects, and it's very dangerous. It can be in the ticks, and what it does is it creates something called Powassan encephalitis, and here's an article about that. So if you'll recall, it, you go, well, what should I take for that? Just go back to the article that I showed you in the beginning about the viral infections and the antivirals. Now, Q fever, some folks don't know about that. Have you ever heard of that? No, that I haven't. Horowitz it says he has found a lot of it in his Lyme patients. And this is another mm -hmm. disease that's called a, a great imitator, just like Lyme, because it can cause things like chronic hepatitis, pneumonia, a relapsing fever, endocarditis, and one of the big differentials here is a Lyme patient that has a heart murmur. So somebody who's having heart problems needs to be checked for Q fever. Only 50% of the people that have this show signs of clinical illness. So this can be way in the background and you eating away at the heart muscle and you never even know it. If it's acute, there's going to be high fever, chills and sweat, aches and pains, severe headaches. You know, how many diseases have those symptoms? A lot. <laughs> right. Abdominal pain. And I was just curious. Go ahead. Yeah, and it says, what, what is, uh, and of course I'm asking this for myself, what's a non-productive cough? 
That means you're coughing, but there's no no mucus coming up. Nothing's coming up. It's just, oh. and it can feel like kind of like a nervous cough, but there's nothing. Uh, nothing there. Okay. Nothing there. Here's what kind of testing you want to do for this. And here's the antibiotic treatments. And then here's a bunch of information about it that you can read. And I've done quite a bit of research on this to see what kind of natural treatments from studies have worked with dealing with this. And a lot of these are things that we would take anyway. There you have your Japanese knotweed again, the olive leaf extract, uh, garlic, the echinacea. The common wireweed keeps coming back again and again and again in all of these Lyme uh, co-infections in Lyme mm -hmm. itself. That is a, a strong antibiotic. And then we've got selenium and coenzyme 10. Vitamin C is a big player in all, all of these as well because vitamin C is needed by the immune system for one thing. And it helps to heal tissue. So make sure you're getting your omega-3s. Alpha lipoic acid helps. So we do have answers to these things. So even if you didn't know for sure you had Q fever, there's a lot of safe mm -hmm. stuff here that you could be doing. And of course, then Rocky Mountain Spinal mm -hmm. Fever, which you know. Rhodiola is good. Again, Japanese knotweed. And Eleothera, which is an adaptogen. This one I thought was really weird to be associated with Lyme because tularemia, do you know what that is? No, I don't. You get it, I always learned you get it from rabbits. But I can oh, sort really? of, yeah, but I can sort of see it because, yeah, that's. Um, it's just like a raw open wound, like it's being eaten at. Yeah, it's pretty bad. And I guess it makes sense, you know, if a tick bites a rabbit and then bites you. Here are symptoms, kind of testing that's done, kind of treatments. Yeah, you can even have tularemia. And then with even typhus can be associated with it. So with chronic Lyme, we start looking at these co-infections big time. To learn more about all of this stuff, folks, just join the database and you can come in here and, and research, find answers. and join Herbal Knowledge Keepers, a Facebook group to share with us. It's a, a closed group, so it's very private. Yeah, that was that was a good size of information. Okay. It's got my wheel. <laughs> yeah, I know. You know, it, it's, we're in danger of becoming hypochondriacs when we're looking at this kind of stuff yeah. and going, oh, I think I've got that one. Oh, I must have that one too. <laughs> I probably have a little bit. I know. Like it. it's, like, it's true, and that's why I said earlier in the show, it's really important. Like, you know, you just keep doing the research, follow the threads, and, and find out, you know, what feels like it's mirroring your own. But it yeah. is hard to decipher. It is, and <laughs> for, for doctors, too. So that's why yeah. when you're looking at the herbs, the herbal protocols, remember, they're very complex. They work on a lot of different levels. That's why they can treat a lot of different things. So zero in on the herbs and the supplements and find out what they're doing and look at how much, what, what the range is of their, their talents, all the different things that they can tackle. And so even though you might not be sure, you know, Japanese knotweed, for example, covers a lot of bases and so if you learn about Japanese knotweed itself and decide okay I'm including that in my protocol based on all that it does and I so you can take go at it from that angle and then diet when we looked at Dr. Rao's protocol all of remember all of these things include lifestyle so that's mm -hmm. something that we can do that's going to cover a lot the sleeping, the exercise, the diet, all of that. So it's interesting and, to, and, to nail it down. And, and probably this section is most important for the practitioners, the doctors and nurses that are subscribed to the database to help them figure out mm -hmm. what's going on with their patients. Yeah, totally. And a reminder, 
you know, when we're treating ourselves herbally and with plants, there's a, it, it's a longer period of time till the body adjusts and you start to see how you're responding to it. It's not like the, you know, quick kill the symptom kind of experience. Unless you're taking and something so, like Borelogen. Yeah, Bor yeah, right. <laughs> Yes. We'll, do, we'll, we'll talk about that maybe next episode. Yeah, we'll do another episode where Dear Woman is going to share with us some amazing experiences she had on Virelogen. So anyway, we'll close out and love to all of you guys. At this time, we're, all of us uh, have our hearts and minds on the folks in Texas and wishing everybody there well and, and everybody pitch in and help the best that you can. We expect to see a lot of new people from Texas moving to Arkansas again like they did after Katrina. So anyway, yeah. love to all and we'll be back in a yeah. couple of weeks. And, right. Thank you everyone. Much love.